And now to a, a topic which is, of course, difficult, but so important to discuss. New York Times colonist David Brooks lost his lifelong friend, Peter, to suicide last April, three years after he was diagnosed with clinical depression. Now, David has detailed what he learned throughout Peter's journey in his latest uh, column, How Do You Serve a Friend in Despair? And joins Hari Srinivasan to share some of those lessons. Paula, thanks. David Brooks, thanks so much for joining us. You wrote a column that resonated with so many New York Times readers, I think in part because it wasn't what you usually write. It wasn't about politics. It wasn't about ideology. It was about your friend, Peter. And the title of it is, How Do You Serve a Friend in Despair? First, for the audience who might not have read the column, tell us a little bit about Peter. Well, Peter and I met when we were 11. We went to the same summer camp uh, in Iverson, Connecticut, a camp called Incarnation Camp. Uh, and we started as campers, and we were there for about 10 years together as campers and counselors. Uh, and uh, we stayed friends for life, oldest friend I ever had. Uh, and I describe him as exuberantly playful. Uh, he was the kind of guy who, uh, the story I tell is he was skipping around our little dining room there. He was a big guy, probably about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and he's skipping around, you know, just being a, his joyous self, and he tries to slip through a, skip through a doorway, and he slams his head on the, the top of the door frame, and he lands flat on his back, and we all crack up, he cracks up, and that to me is him. Uh, and as he aged, he got probably a little more serious. He did well in school, became, when joined the Navy, became an eye surgeon. Uh, and he uh, was, my wife had a phrase about him that uh, I put in the piece, which is he was uh, extraordinary and ordinary at the same time. And she meant that as a high compliment, which is to say he was masculine the way you're supposed to be masculine, just understated uh, and gentle, a father the way you're supposed to be a father, filled with just playfulness and joy and pride in his sons. And he always said uh, he was the luckiest man in his marriage because he, uh, the person in the whole world he wanted to talk to uh, when he got home at night was going to be sitting there right across from him at the dining room table. So he had, in many ways, uh, a very rich and, and blessed life. You describe a change in the spring of 2019. What happened? Yeah, I went back. We went back to camp just to hang out there. And um, it was in June of 2019. And my wife noticed something immediately in him that his uh, affect, his emotional state had gone flat. And there was a flatness in his voice. And there was a certain thing we did every time. You're not going to believe this, Hari, but I uh, play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and so our favorite thing to do was to play basketball uh, and then go run and jump in the lake by there and go swimming. Uh, and he was doing the thing he loved to do most in the world. And he still wasn't enjoying it. And so he pulled us aside at the end of that weekend and, and said, there's something amiss. There's something gone differently with me. And he just asked for our friendship and support, which, of course, was easy to give. So he was conscious that there was a change in how he was perceiving the world. What steps was he taking to figure it out? Well, you know, he was a doctor. And so he was early on um, diagnosed with clinical depression. And he, of, of course, saw, I, I, I said I... There were almost two peats during the three years that he suffered from this severe depression. Um, the first um, Pete was the one who was suffering. And the second Pete was the one who was standing back and observing him suffering and just trying to figure out. Uh, and they went through every possible um, uh, treatment they could think of. And I think that the tour through the healthcare system was filled with choices and severe and bitter disappointments when something wouldn't work. And his wife, Jen, and I have spoken often about this, um, that she, they both came to realize that the mental health care system is horribly siloed. That in her case, she has had cancer and they had what they call the tumor board, a whole bunch of different doctors, all bringing different perspectives on one case. But in mental health, at least in many places, you try one treatment with one doctor, you build a relationship with that doctor, and then if the treatment doesn't work, you're gone. You're off to the next doctor. Uh, and so it's just one silo after another. And so he was not someone who was going untreated. He was someone who, who tried everything. Three years with this brutal illness, these lying voices, these obsessive compulsion. Uh, Pete fought it every step of the way. And it was revelatory to me how little we know about depression, even after all these years, after so many people have suffered from it. Uh, 
uh, and how little research money we're devoting to it. And, and we really should be devoting a lot more because it has become an epidemic, as we know. You know. Part of what's intriguing about your friend, I think, to a lot of the readers, is that this is a person, and we say this often after suicide, seemed to have it all, right? He had a support system. He had people who loved him, that he loved, um, a wonderful family. Uh, he was aware that this was happening, and yet, at the end, he took his own life. And what does that say to you about how deep depression is? Yeah, it's just a monster of a disease. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not, uh, Stephen Fry has a, a saying, the actor, um, that if you have a friend with depression, don't ask him why. Mm. Uh, and I think it just walk with them and be there at the other end. Uh, and I think that I, I've learned a lot from that, that um, you don't want to ask why. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, Pete had theories, but I'm not sure there really is a why. I think I just, you know, in my own little way, I, I learned a lot about the disease during those three years. And the first thing I learned was that don't think you can understand it by extrapolating from your own periods of sadness. Yeah. If you've never suffered from depression, it's not an extension of sadness. It's an altered state of consciousness. Uh, and I, I learned that, you know, don't try to fix the other person. And early in our, those three years when we were talking by phone, mostly during COVID, uh, I would say, you know, you know, you used to love going to Vietnam and, and doing surgery and, you know, curing people to do that, go do that. And those are my suggestions. And I since learned if you try to give people suggestions on how to get out of it, really, you're just telling them you just don't get it. <laughs> you just don't understand what they're going through. It's not ideas about what to do. It's the motivational desire. It's the just the loss of all pleasure. Uh, second thing I would do is like, like say, you got a great, you know, just, you know, we just said you got it all. You, you're a successful and very accomplished surgeon. You've got wonderful kids, a wonderful marriage. Think how good your life is. And I've learned that's also not the right thing to say, because if you tell people they should be enjoying they feel bad about not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable. And so I learned uh, that's just not how to do it. And I'll just finally, the one thing I think I helped, the one nice thing I did that Pete found some solace in, I sent him a video, which I recommend to um, viewers, which is was a sermon given by my news hour colleague, Michael Gerson, uh, who had suffered from depression. Uh, and he gave a sermon about it at the National Cathedral, and it's online at YouTube. Uh, and he said, depression is a malfunction in the apparatus we use to perceive reality. And that is the person who's suffering depression isn't seeing reality, frankly, the way they should. And Mike said he had these obsessive compulsive uh, voices in his head lying to him that you're not worth anything. No one will miss you. And I think when I sent Pete that, that video, that one thing, Pete said, yes, that's what it's like. And so I really got an appreciation for the magnitude of the disease. I lost a friend to this a few years ago, and I still struggle with the kind of mix of emotions that I feel about it. And on the one hand, obviously, I'm incredibly sad that I lost this buddy of mine who I've loved for a long time and who I won't get to grow old with. And then at the same time, there's these little pangs of, anger. Like, why did you do this? Why did you leave your wife and daughters? Why did you leave me and all of our friends? Right? It's like a, it's a very complex web of emotions that this triggers for so many people around you in a way that if he busted a leg, it wouldn't, you know, it's a, it's, it's just horrifying to those uh, that are kind of left behind. That's because we have the illusion that it's free will, that, the, that mm. we have the illusion that that person's mind is on our, our side and that person's right. mind is on his side. And so we assume our minds are on their side. And so we think, well, how did you do this? And I, I think Pete, I, I, he never told me this, but I think in his final days, he persuaded himself that he was doing a favor for his family. He was relieving them of the burden. Maybe your friend had the same thoughts. And all I can tell you, if anybody's ever have that thought grew through their mind, Having lived through the wreckage of what happened, I can tell you that that thought is completely wrong. Uh, but, you know, we, so I, th I think we've learned to try to overcome that thought that you just made a big mistake because the, the machine with which they made the mistake was severely malfunctioning. 
And the other thing, I'd say two other quick things, Hari. Um, the first thing uh, is I've learned, I feel I should have done other things differently. I should have sent a more postcards, just little texts saying, you know, I'm thinking about you, you don't need to reply. I should have done that. And so I feel regret about that. But I don't think there's anything any of us could have done to alter what happened. Um, and so that, that's, um, uh, that's, I think, something that those of us who are still here um, should give ourselves, you know, some forgiveness about that, that this disease, it was, if it was bigger than my friend Pete or your friend, it's going to be bigger than us. According to the NIH, between 2000 and 2020, uh, one in five Americans were uh, affected by mental illness. And the CDC put out a youth risk behavior survey uh, this month, and that was incredibly disturbing. According to the report, in 2021, almost 60% of female students experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness during the past year. Nearly 25% made a suicide plan. That's one in four young girls. Uh, I, this is just staggering that if it was anything else that was affecting this large of a proportion of our population, you'd think we'd move heaven and earth to do something about it. Yeah, and the, the research into depression is still so much smaller than cancer and other things, which obviously we should be researching. And I think about it in two levels. First, on the individual level with my friend or your friend, there's no great trend that explains it. It was particular to that person. But I think society, on the societal level, I do think we can point to some trends. I mean, for the shocking numbers of teenage girls, the number one answer is social media. Uh, there's, their social media participation is at its highest. And I do think it's, it's – and if you look at the trends of when it really turned and spiked, it's right around 2012, 2013 – and that's the smartphone. That's when the smartphone happened. And so social media plays a just a gigantic role. It doesn't, I don't think, play a role for the, a lot of the other people who are suffering from depression, suicide, or even the deaths of despair, who are you know, older men, presumably. And there I, I would point to of two things. One, the loss of community, uh, the bowling alone, the, the idea that we people used to be ensconced and enshrouded in this web of thick relationships at an Elks Club, a bowling league, uh, at a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Uh, and just a lot of people are not enshrouded in those webs of, of rich relationship the way they used to. And then the second, and this would be a little more controversial, but is my theory, which is that for many centuries in our different cultures and our different religions and our different civilizations, we taught each other how to be considerate to each other in the daily rituals of life. There was a great cause of what you would call moral formation, trying to teach each other how to be kind, just like how to do hard social skills, how to have a hard conversation, how to disagree with respect, how to ask for forgiveness, how to sit through someone who is suffering and have a good conversation. Mm. And for some reason in our culture, we don't teach those skills. And I feel we've just dropped the ball in teaching the elemental social skills of tending to each other. Now, what is it you think that explains the kind of disorientation for us who've been left behind. I mean, you write uh, eloquently that, you know, it's as if I went to Montana and suddenly the mountains had disappeared. And that's a good way to look at it. But w why do you think that is, that it is so monumental to the friends and family? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, especially it was like Pete, I knew since I was 11. It's basically a lifelong friend, somebody I always assumed would always be there. And suddenly to have him not there is like just disorienting. But I think grief when it's the death of a friend is, is, um, is different and unusual. And it, I found more serious than I anticipated. All right, back when you and I were wayward youths, we used to do a little <laughs> program called the Double Header. <laughs> uh, and you, me, and Mark Shields would get together to, to talk about uh, sports. Yeah. And, and so Mark and I were partners on the News Hour. Of uh, for 20 odd years. And he also died uh, last year. And it's just like, that guy's just been around and, and he's been woven into your life. And Mike Gerson, whose sermon I quoted, he also died. Uh, and so those three losses were for me, uh, um, an introduction into grief of one's friends. And it, it really is. Um, and when, you, you know, I've learned that when you suffer a grief, it basically um, 
upsets all the mental models of reality that you have in you. Uh, what one expert called your assumptive world, the assumptions you make about reality. And those models are all destroyed and you have to go through a process to make a new set of models, a new set of assumptions about what it's like. And that's just a process of grief that's unconscious, that goes at its own pace, that's filled with repetitions and painful memories and happy memories and is unpredictable. And there's no shortcut through that process. You know, your, your article, your column was titled, How Do You Serve a Friend in Despair? So what's your, what's your tip on how we can serve people in our lives that we find in these situations? Yeah, I think when and any encounter, but especially an encounter with someone who's suffering, they're looking to you to answer a few basic questions. Uh, do I matter to you? Am I a priority for you? Are you still there? Will you leave me? And I think those are the only questions you can answer. You can't answer the questions, why is this happening? You can't answer the questions, how do you get out of this? You can only answer the questions, am I a priority for you? Will you walk with me? And I think that's the best you can do. You just ride it out. And, and toward the end of the process, I wasn't trying to do much. I was just trying to be present as the normal friend we, we always had and hoping that he would be able to be present in the normal friend he always was. So in some sense, it's a scaling down of um, expectations, but to be present um, is no small thing to somebody. And then I, I had another friend who was a mutual friend of mine and Pete who said, you know, give his spouse or give his, the people who are his primary caretakers, give them some time off, uh, give them some moment to relax. And so that was also something I, I wish I'd done a little more of COVID sort of inhibited us in that. But um, uh, I, I do think those are also wise words. Columnist for the New York Times, David Brooks. Thanks so much for the column and, and for writing this and my condolences to Pete's family and to you and your, uh, the rest of Pete's friends for their loss. Okay. Well, thank you, Ari. It's, um, it's good to be with you again. It's good to be, and it's good to be able to talk about Pete. A worthy conversation there. So if you or anyone you know is in need of help in the United States, you can call or text 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. It provides confidential support. And for anyone outside of the United States, a worldwide directory of resources and international hotlines is provided by the International Association for Suicide Prevention. You can also turn to the global organization, Befrienders.